You are important. You belong. You have a destiny and a future. World Impact Celebration Church Online is a spiritual family of believers from all over the world where you can discover your purpose and grow in the grace of Jesus Christ. You will hear teachings by Dr. Peter Youngren, Pastor Nathan Thurber, and others. You will participate in worship, prayer, and taking the Lord's communion every week. You will enjoy video testimonies and interviews from around the world. No matter where you live, your prayer request will be included in every service. This will truly be an international online church. Wherever you live, from Southeast Asia to Europe, North and South America, Africa, and Australia, this can be your spiritual home. All over the world, I meet people who ask me if there's a way that they can participate in the services from the Toronto Celebration Church. Well, we're offering something much more than just a streaming service. This is a full-fledged online church for you. The World Impact Celebration Church Online is a place where you can find a spiritual family, a place of belonging, and where you can grow in the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. Set your calendar for 10.30 a.m. New York time. That's 4.30 p.m. Central European time and 10.30 p.m. for most countries in Southeast Asia. Heaven will include people of every culture, nationality, and ethnicity, and this will be a foretaste of heaven. World Impact Celebration Church Online is a place where you belong, where you will be nurtured, and where you can find your destiny. of the Toronto Celebration Church is a story of God's love drawing people from different backgrounds, cultures, even religions to be empowered to live their maximum life and to serve the community and the world. When I came here, I couldn't walk. I couldn't stand. I had a walker. But when I came to TICC, I was totally and completely miraculously healed. TICC is a family for us, for me and my husband. Uh, one of the best things that I really like about TICC is definitely the youth ministry or the youth program. And I'm truly blessed here uh, by the simple message of God's unconditional love, grace and mercy. I found the church I've always dreamed of. A church is not about building. It is about people. People from every part of society, young and old people from Asia, Europe, the islands of the sea, Africa, and across the Americas, together creating a better society. Because to personally know God's love is the key to the ultimate life. And in a constant pursuit to find ways to communicate the gospel of Jesus Christ to Toronto and Canada, we believe that the best is yet to come. 
Welcome to Celebration Church Online today. We're excited to have you with us. Pastor Peter uh, will be with us as well. Holy Communion, uh, exciting ministry report of what God is doing. We look forward to share that with you as well. Uh, also here, if you're here in Toronto, of course, I'm sure you're well aware that we're about to move into stage two of our reopening. Of course, already in stage one, we're meeting indoors, in person. And so, especially as we move into stage two very shortly, we, we, look, we can't wait to see every one of our members assembled back together here at 190 Railside Road. In fact, today we're meeting together. But today here in this online format, we're honored that, that you've joined us. It's a great time to be together. Uh, and I believe God has something good for you today. So why don't we Take a moment just to give God thanks through music. Our worship team is going to lead us in worship. And then as soon as that's done, we'll get right into the message today. God bless you.
That's beautiful. Now, last week we took a look at a topic of the scriptures as of our nature as people of the spirit. Today we're continuing that with the message, gifted your spiritual reality, gifted your spiritual uh, reality. And last week we saw how as, new, as individuals living in this new covenant of God's grace, we saw a main benefit of the new covenant being how God gave us himself. And God gave us himself in the form of the Holy Spirit who now indwells the, the hearts and minds, the body of believers on Christ Jesus. And now the Holy Spirit who lives in us, he, he causes us to do and to, uh, he causes us to will and to do God's good pleasure. In other words, you could say he makes the blessings of the covenant attainable. Without the Holy Spirit, we wouldn't be able to attain to that which God is in Christ given us, whether it be sanctification or righteousness or healing or prosperity, the Holy Spirit works that in and through us. And so as people of the Spirit, with whom the Spirit lives and dwells in, in us, we recognize what the Scriptures mean when it says that we are now temples of the Holy Spirit. The Scriptures call believers in Christ temples of the Holy Spirit. And I'm recapping what we looked at last week. So if, if you say, where do you get all that from? Go to last week's message and you'll see all the references. But we are temples of the Holy Spirit. And of course, the, the, frame, the framework of 
of a temple in the Old Testament, uh, it referred to a physical structure where God dwelt, where the people met with God, and uh, where sacrifices were made and forgiveness was given. It was where God lived on earth. So you could say it was heaven on earth. And so the temple was a big deal. But fast forward now to the new covenant in which we live, and the Apostle Paul says we are now temples of the Holy Spirit. That means that God dwells in us. His presence lives in us. Uh, you could say heaven on earth. That's where, it's where the divine meets the flesh, God in us. And so we are people of the Spirit, and God's presence manifests, of course, individually speaking, in every one of our lives. Every believer has the full presence of God, the full Holy Spirit. When you believe on Christ, you don't get half of God, half of the Spirit. No, you get the full Spirit, the full manifestation of who God is uh, in us, Christ in us, manifest through the Holy Spirit in us, uh, and we have, we have all of Him. And so the, the God's presence, who he is, manifests individually for every believer. But then we also saw how it manifests collectively uh, in the lives of believers as we collectively assemble together in the, as temples. Uh, for example, Peter referred to it, and again, I'm recapping last week, so if you want all the references that I'm referring to and going over, uh, just go back to last week. But the book, uh, Peter referenced us as living stones. In other words, every one of us are a living stone. Every one of us has God in us. Everyone has Christ. Everyone, every believer has the Holy Spirit. We're each individually temples, or each, we're each living stones, but then we're assembled together to make a living temple or a living uh, uh, a tabernacle where we offer up sacrifices of praises to God. And so we're, uh, God's presence manifests individually in the life of every person, but then collectively we're assembled or we're brought together to form a beautiful temple on earth where God's presence manifests and, and where people experience God as we assemble together as people of the Spirit. Uh, an, an individual a pastor named David Clarkson, actually, he's no longer living, but he was a Puritan pastor. Uh, he, he had a quote, and I think it so beautifully summarizes what we talked about last week. And he said, the Lord engages himself to let forth, as it were, a stream of his comfortable, quickening presence to every person. And make no mistake, if you're a believer in Christ, you have that wonderful stream in your heart, in your being. Uh, but when many of these particulars, now it's this person no longer living, he used some old language that they used to use uh, many years ago. But he said, but when, he, when many of these particulars join together to worship God, then these several streams are united and meet in one. So that the presence of God, which enjoyed in private, and we all enjoy our relationship with Jesus beautifully in private. But in public, those streams become a river, a river that makes glad the city of God. And so, again, we're complete in Christ. We have the Holy Spirit in us, but then we assemble together, and it makes a beautiful, in this, in this pastor's language, a beautiful river that, that blesses others, that strengthens others. And can you know, I was thinking about it over the last couple of weeks. In fact, a lady in our church emailed me just this week, and she had, she had assembled with us in person last Sunday as we came together as a church. And, and she said, you know, Nathan, a couple of months ago, we, she had suffered a huge financial setback and loss. And she said a heavy oppression just settled over her mind, a, a darkness. And it just, it was weighing on her. But she said, as we gathered together and we were worshiping, and as the word went forth, and as we prayed, she said, and as, and in her words, that we allowed the Holy Spirit to move freely, she said, I was released from that oppressed mind. You see, that's when believers who are complete in Christ, who have the presence in them, come together and begin to worship, begin to pray, begin to search the scriptures. It's like a stream that sets free others. It's a beautiful reality. And this lady experienced this last week in our, in, in our service. And then two weeks ago, uh, at our drive-in service, in fact, uh, one of our pastors met a lady, and, and, and the lady doesn't come to her, hadn't come to our church. In fact, doesn't even live in our area. Uh, she happened to be driving by, and, and we, there's a gas station here by our church in Toronto, and, 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 and she heard the music. She heard the worship. She heard the preaching over the stairs, so she drove up. What's going on? And she was a believer, but she had, her husband had died, and she was a, she, he, prematurely. He was at work and died. She has two teenage children, and she said she had been so despondent and so weighed down by this, but they 
there in our drive-in service just two weeks ago. She said, in her words, I experienced a wonderful presence and refreshing. And so you see how as complete individuals in Christ come together, there creates these rivers where others are blessed. But we are blessed, but others are blessed as well. And it's a wonderful, wonderful reality that we see continually. And see, we see this assembly as so important. We are called to a collective. The scriptures call it a body. We're called the body of Christ. And again, the body in the natural is a wonderful example of this and how every cell of our body contains our DNA. Not one cell doesn't contain the DNA. No, every cell is complete. But the cells, if our cells of our body just suddenly dissipated into this, every which direction, you would cease to be the beautiful you that you are. So our cells of the body, cells of our body, which are complete, they, they have the complete, your complete DNA in every cell, but they have to come together to form something beautiful. In the same way, we as living stones, we come together and we form Jesus Christ's beautiful body on this earth. Amen? Yeah, and, and, and we see it throughout, throughout scriptures, this reality. Genesis, God created Adam, saw that he was good, but he said it's not good that he's alone. Adam was lacking, Adam was in God's image. And yet there's something about the way God created us that even though Adam was complete, God looked at him and said, I, I see what I've created is good. But he still says it's not good that he's alone. In the same way, we as believers, yes, we have Christ. Yes, we are complete in him, but we still need each other. And that's the reality uh, of what the scriptures teach us. The word church in the New Testament is, comes from a word, Greek word ecclesia, which means to assemble or to gather. There was a Greek individual in our service uh, last Sunday, and he came up to me after the service and said, you're right, Nathan, that's what the word means. And he said it in such beautiful Greek, Greek, Greek um, accent, I should say. But, 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 but the word for church in the New Testament, and yes, is the universal church, but by and large in the New Testament, when the word church is used, it's the word ecclesia, which means to assemble or to gather. And so when we refer to a church, you know, some, some, you know, to gather together is not just a nice thing to do. You know, it's what a church is. And if a church isn't gathering, it ceases to be a church. Yes, there's the universal church, but by and large, when the scriptures talk about church in the New Testament, it's talking about that assembly together. In the New Testament pattern in Acts and other books of the Bible, in the New Testament, follow that pattern. They regularly met together. They, they, there was a specific place where they came. They had specific activities uh, and specific th events happened when they met together. And so, again, it's our example. And I'm recapping that. We're going to go further with this today. But this is a very pertinent question for us right now. Because COVID-19 and the last year and a half of lockdowns have, have, have now caused us each to have to ask the question, what is the point of assembling together? Because we, we got away with it, you could say, for a year and a half, not assembling. And many people have been blessed. Many people have been encouraged through these online forums. So what is even the point of, of taking the time, getting our kids ready, uh, get, you know, to get in the car or the bus? What's the point of assembling together? Uh, and, and again, it's kind of like a marriage, though. You know, a marriage, you know, if someone's in the military, they might go overseas to fight a battle for a year, what, you know, some, or extended period of time. And that marriage can, can hold, like, that marriage can stay together. You, you meet, you know, you communicate by Zoom or by, by phone, etc. But eventually, the husband and wife have got to get back together or else that marriage will stop. Marriage will break down. The marriage will cease to be. You know, in the same way, you know, virtual church and, and online, it's, it's good for a season. And we thank God for TV ministry and online ministry. We do TV ministry here. We are going to do online ministry forever. But, but as a local church gathering, it's not meant to be simply online. It has to be together. I mean, it's the New Testament pattern. And so we, we have to ask that question, what's the point? And we see how the essence of the church in the New Covenant and God's plan for the body of Christ is to assemble or to gather together. And now that things are reopening, in fact, in, here in Ontario, we're going to stage two. And so uh, very quickly, they say, uh, because the case counts are almost, you know, almost nil. And so they're getting us, and by fall, they say, we're back to normal life. And so again, as things are opening and things are becoming, by and large, back to normal, the question now has to be asked of every one of us, uh, what's the point of gathering? But I think the scriptures are clear and they show us an opportunity. In fact, this message is not a message of desperation, but actually I see it as one of opportunity. In fact, I'm so encouraged over this last year and a half of 
you know, barely being able to meet. I'm not encouraged by that by any measure, but I'm encouraged how strong our church has been and how, 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 how much we've been able to do and accomplish. In fact, the very first message that I preached going in was crisis time is opportunity time. March of 2020, I still remember it. And in many ways, it's been an opportunity for us as a church. Uh, we, we've doubled up our missions giving. Uh, we've done more than ever, you could say. You've heard about the pers help for persecuted Christians and the different endeavors we've taken on as a church family. So our church isn't limping forward by any measure. This is not a, mes a message that, oh, poor us, if we don't do something quickly, we're going to go under. No, we're, we're, doing real, we're doing well. We're doing very well. But I think in some ways it's, it's caused us to realize, you know what, we can do so much more. If we could do that when we were under such... Uh, uh, you know, uh, crisis time, how much more can we do? We're, you could say we're stronger than we thought. And so I view this as a launching pad. In many ways, pressure time, even in the natural, if you approach the pressure correctly, it causes you to form deeper roots. And I see that happening with our church family. In fact, I see that, that this is an opportunity for us to not just, you know, we've doubled up our missions giving this year, but in every area to go deeper, to go farther as a launching pad, as we look from fresh eyes. You know, we've never really had to look at what's the point of gathering. We just took it for granted. But now we look at it with fresh eyes and we see with fresh revelation and fresh purpose, what's the point? And when we see what's the point, we don't take it for granted. In fact, every time we come together, we lean in and we receive everything that, you know, maybe in the past, maybe we took it for granted. Not anymore, because it was in some ways taken away for, you could say, a year, year and a half. And so that we are a spirit, yeah, we're people of the spirit, we assemble, when we assemble, it's a spiritual thing that happens. But, that, but also, we have a spiritual purpose. And our spiritual purpose is to enforce Jesus' victory on this earth. Colossians chapter 2, it says that Jesus defeated principalities and powers. Those principalities and powers are the powers that hold, held, hold or held people under the sway of sin, under the sway of, of bondage. Jesus defeated those, and now we as a spiritual assembly, spiritual people, we enforce that victory. In other words, we preach the gospel, we preach freedom to people, and people discover it. And they are set free. That's our purpose. When we gather together, we make ourselves visible to the principalities and powers. We make ourselves visible to the world, to the, univer to the, to the universe, and we enforce the victory of Jesus Christ. And yes, we are in, 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 in each one of us have authority, but when we come together, there's that joint unity of authority, and we speak to the principalities and powers. We reveal God's love. We reveal his victory to individuals. You can say, well, couldn't God do that without us, Nathan? Well, of course he could. So he created us. He created the world, and so God could do it without us. But he chose us. He chose you. He chose me to do this work through us. That's, that's the premise of Matthew 28. He, Jesus said, go into all the world and preach the gospel. And so uh, the essence, yes, of course, God could do it without us, but he chose us to work through us. And I reminded of a story in, after World War II, some German students, they were, they were cleaning up a cathedral that had been bombed, and there was a statue of Jesus. And this statue, uh, because of the bombings, he, the hands of that statue had been removed. You can see the picture on the screen, and the hands had been removed. Now, at the bottom of that, of that particular uh, statue was the engraving, Come unto me, Jesus' famous words, Come unto me, all you who are weary and heavy laden. Beautiful scripture. And so they, they thought, well, how are we going to put the hands back on Jesus so that he, you know, so he come unto me? And, and one student thought, well, let's not put his hands on. In fact, let's change the inscription. And so they put the inscription on the bottom, Christ has no hands but our hands. And in a way, it's a picture of how God works on, in the earth today. God works through people. He works through us. We see ourselves as spiritual beings, people of the Spirit, and we see how God works through us to touch the world. And so you could say the church, the visible gathering of the church, is, God's, is the visible community of God's people on earth. Toronto needs Toronto Celebration Church to be strong. The world needs this church family to be strong because we are the visible, not just us, of course, other local gatherings, but we, God's called us together with a vision and a mission and a purpose, and we are that visible community of God's people. We're people of the Spirit. Now, our purpose is highlighted in Ephesians chapter 4. Let's go there for a moment, Ephesians chapter 4, where it says, There is one body and one spirit, but to each one of us a grace was given according to the measure of Christ's gift. 
And we are to grow up in all aspects into him who is the head, that is Christ, from whom the whole body being fitted and held together by whatever joint supplies according to the proper working of each individual part causes the growth of the body for the building itself up in love. You see, what we see, we've established that as people of the Spirit, we have a purpose. The purpose is to enforce Christ's victory, to preach the gospel. How does that happen? Through the church. And then we see here in Ephesians chapter 4, we see three things. First of all, each one of us has a gift. Every single one of us. Ephesians chapter 1, to each one grace was given. To each one a gift was given. Everyone has a gift. Peter backs that up in 1 Peter 4 and 10. As each one has received a special gift, employ it in the serving of one another as good stewards of the multifaceted grace of God. Everyone has a gift. And God has a plan for every single believer. Everyone watching, to you watching today, me watching, me preaching today. God has a plan for you to be involved and to use your gift in the minist- gospel ministry work of a local church. God has a plan for you to use your gift. He was very clear. The scriptures are clear. Every believer, every person has a gift. That's why my message is gifted your spiritual reality. In Christ, he gave every person a gift. And that gift, you know, God's not looking for perfect people. God's not looking for, he's looking for willing. You say, well, I'm not full, I'm not perfectly skilled to do do such and such. You know, God's looking for willing people, not perfect. But he says, everyone has a gift. Secondly, we saw from that passage that we grow in our gift. We grow in in our gifts. We don't start off complete. You know, sometimes people don't get involved working in a local church, helping out, because they don't feel qualified. But the reality is we grow in our gifts, and until we start operating in it, until we start moving forward, we can't even learn. You know, if you think of a ship on the water, you can't steer a ship that's not moving. A ship has to be moving to steer. And so, of course, when we start engaging and using the gifts that God has given to us in the local church, you, we might make mistakes. Every one of us does, of course. But, but, but unless we're moved, but they can be corrected. But, but unless we're moving forward, there can be no course correction. And so we grow in that gift as we begin to move forward, begin to use it. And also, thirdly, we saw that the church grows when everyone uses their gift. The church, this church family, I'll say it boldly, this church family needs your gift to grow. And the more, the more people who use their gifts, the more growth that happens because every person has a gift. And the church grows when every person uses their gift. Remember, the purpose of the church is to enforce Jesus' victory on this earth. But the church happens when every person uses their gift. You know, the church has been likened to a, a symphony. I enjoy the symphony. I haven't been to it for a while, given all the lockdowns. Probably you haven't either. But the church has been likened to a symphony. And a symphony, you know, the American Psycholo- Psychological Association did a study on, on symphonies and how the various members of the symphony relate or view each other. It was interesting. Percussionists. They were viewed as insensitive and unintelligent, hard of hearing, yet very fun-loving. Stringed players were viewed as arrogant, stuffy, and unathletic. Brass players were viewed as loud. Woodwind players were held in high esteem, but seemed to be a little bit aloof uh, 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 and sometimes a little bit egotistical. So these are the ways that they viewed each other, this study study showed. And so the question that the study asked was, well, with such different personalities, how did they come together to make such beautiful music? music. And they found the answer was really quite simple. That regardless of how the musicians viewed each other, they subordinated their feelings about each other to the leadership of the conductor. And I think that so wonderfully describes how the church operates. You know, even take our church, Toronto Celebration Church, or maybe some of you are watching globally, but if you think about our church, our church is made up of people of different ages, some rich, some poor, some of different political backgrounds, uh, uh, some of different uh, eth- certainly ethnicities, that's Toronto, different ways of thinking, so, so, so much differences. And, and, and if we just focus on those, we could wonder, how could we ever come together to do anything special? But, but just like that symphony, what we do is we come together and subordinate our feelings of each other to the Lordship of Jesus Christ. We look to him and begin to move forward with his purposes, his mission. His, that's why I love sharing these ministry reports every week of what this church is, what we're together doing, because it's not one person, it's together. And when, but when our focus is on Christ, we begin to make beautiful music together. That's why every person's gift is so vitally important. And so we see that together. Now, a second passage I want to, show, I want to read one, to look at the, our purpose one more way from another angle, Romans chapter 12. 
And, and verse 1. Let's read with me here. Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, by the mercies of God, so everything we're about to read is by the mercies of God. In other words, it's a response to God's grace. Present your bodies as living and holy sacrifices, acceptable to God, which is your spiritual service of worship. Now pause for a moment. We're talking here about our spiritual wor service of worship. Uh, and so our, our minds can go in many directions. What is our spiritual service of worship? How do I define, what is my spiritual, is that when I come together, you know, we just, we just were in a time of worship a moment ago, we had our, our hands up praising the Lord and singing song, is that my spiritual service of worship? What is, and by the way, that is worship, of course we call it worship, but as, according to Romans chapter 12, and it's about to define it, we're going to go to the next, the next verse and find what, how does Paul in Romans define my spiritual service of worship? Rather interesting how that happens. Let's go to the next verse, verse, verse 4. For just as we have many parts in one body, and all parts don't have the same function, so we who are many are one body in Christ and individually parts of one another. However, since we have gifts that differ according to the grace given to us, each is to use them properly. We're going to pause. I'm going to read the rest of it in a moment. PowerPoint people, stay ready. Keep that up there. But notice what I just read here. Romans chapter 12 and 1, it says... But based on the grace of God, respond to it and, and, and give your spiritual service of worship. How do we do that? Well, we're reading right now. We do that by using our gifts, which we already established. God's given every one of us a gift by grace. We respond, we give our spiritual service of worship by responding to God's grace and using our gifts in the church. It's a wonderful reality. I'm going to let that sink in for a minute. Because it's not just this out there idea, how do I give my spiritual service of worship? No, he's making it very clear. We use our gifts in the body. And, and again, when he's referring to the body, he's not just talking about the universal church. Because he's going to list the gifts, and he's going to list the ways we use it. And there's no way it's just some universal church that, that has no defined uh, parameters and no defined meeting place. or no def Because... If that was the case, you couldn't do what he's about to say you can do with your gifts. And he lists a few of the gifts. Let's keep reading. If prophecy in proportion to one's faith. I mean, you need someone to prophesy to if you're going to prophesy. Then he says, if service in the act of serving others. Or if, one, if you're teaching, then teach. Or if your gift is exhorting, then exhort. Or if you're a giver, then give. Uh, or if you uh, have leadership abilities, then lead. And do it with diligence. And if you, or if you have the gift of mercy, then do it with cheerfulness. Again, you need people to do that with. You need an organ. So again, it's through the church. When we use our gifts through the church, we are offering up our spiritual service of worship to Jesus, which again is a response to grace. This could be taught in such a legalistic way. That's not what I'm doing. But I'm saying that this is how we offer up our spiritual service of worship, by using our, our gifts. Again, we see that, number one, every person has a gift. Every person has a gift, and I wish I had time in this format. I'm going to have to, for our PowerPoint people, skip a few verses, but every one of us has a gift, and, 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 and we see even in the book of Acts. For example, in Acts 9, I won't go there, but in Acts 9, they're talking about Dorcas, who made clothes, and they exalt her as using that ability to serve in the church. Or we see in the book of Acts when they, when they needed men to, individuals to wait on tables. They, they sought after spirit-filled individuals, uh, to do this task. And these are tasks that are viewed as gifts in the church that help the church to do its purpose. Sometimes, again, this, you know, the, 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 the certain roles get elevated and say they're the ones doing it all. No. In the scriptures, say that those waiting on tables, those making clothes, those do, are all gifts, all part of the same body, all of the same reward in that which is being done. So every person has a gift. And sometimes when we talk about gifts, people get, quote unquote, so spiritual uh, that, that there is no help to others. You know, the gift, many of the gifts in the scriptures, especially the New Testament church, are very practical, helping others. And I think even in our church family, I have so many people, and I know in many ways I'm preaching to the choir, so many people get involved practically speaking, whether it be greeting, ushering, helping, uh, serving, and, you know, even today with the camera operators. These are, this is all one, part of one body. And, and we see that in the New Testament. It wasn't all Paul preaching on the, uh, or Peter's shadow. There were people making clothes. There were people waiting on tables. And it all made the whole thing happen, made the body of Christ and forced Jesus' victory on earth. Every one of us has a gift. We have to recognize that. Every one of us has, the, has a gift. Secondly, we also saw that, see that our, from this passage that our worship 
Part of our worship is to serve others in the church. Part of our worship is to serve others in and through the church. Part of our worship. And so, you know, I thought of, thought of Kenneth Hagin. You know, he, he had a quote and he said, you know, when we come together, when we assemble together, and he taught this strongly, the point isn't simply to receive something for myself. Of course we do. But the point is, to, our focus should be, what can I give to others? What can I give to others? That's the point. Uh, you know, in Corinthians, it talks about the gifts of the Spirit. And it says, one has a word for this, and one has this, and one has this. It's all about giving something, uh, something to others. But, of course, we recognize that in the giving to others, we ourselves are, are strengthened and blessed. It's, uh, God gave us a beautiful illustration in nature of the Dead Sea, the Sea of Galilee and the Dead Sea. And in, termino in, the term in the terminology that I'm using today, I think you see a picture of the Dead Sea there and the Sea of Galilee. You know, the Sea of Galilee has accepted its gift and it's accepted its role to uh, duty. Put that up, keep it up there for a second. The Sea of Galilee is always at work. It's always feeding water to the Dead Sea. And it's full of life. It's full of you know, fishes and plants. You know, unfortunately, the Dead Sea, you could say, hasn't accepted its role. It doesn't do any work. It doesn't give any water anywhere. It just, keep, just keeps collecting, and the Dead Sea is dead. It's, it's no life in it whatsoever. You know, it's a picture of when we get involved using our gift, it doesn't deplete us. It actually strengthens us. You know, one of our, our servers here at uh, church, the, I was talking to them, or we were communicating this week, and she sent me a little note, and I want to read just a little quote to you today from it. It's so encouraging on this very topic. She said, serving in the body is a gift that keeps on giving. I receive so much joy to see how people are lifted in spirit as a result of what they experience in the service. It's such a precious gift to me, so I call it an opportunity to serve. A gift that keeps on giving, because honestly, I consider it a gift to be able to serve. It encourages my soul so much, and in that way, I say I'm bolstered by serving. Yes, it takes time and energy. Sometimes it's mentally and physically demanding to be in a position of service, but the end result is always it brings joy and pleasure, because we know that we've helped people in their walk of faith. Every day, it is so rewarding. And so again, when we get activated using our gift, uh, focused on others, it doesn't deplete us, but it actually, like the, dead, like the Dead Sea or the Sea of Galilee, the Sea of flourishing and full of life. You know, the most excited, full of life, joyous people I know are people that I get involved using their gift, again, received by grace, but using it to help others. And that leads to our final point, and then we're done. Grace is our motivation for serving others. Let it be established forever. Grace is our motivation for serving others. Hebrews 12 says, therefore, since we have received a kingdom which cannot be shaken, let us have grace by which we may serve or worship God acceptably and with reverence and godly Fear. Grace. Grace is our motivating factor. It's not a legalist. I'm not a legalistic burden. I've heard sermons like this preached where it's that you got to do this. If God will be displeased with you. That's not, not what I'm saying. God is pleased with you. He loves you. I'm saying you have a gift. And with that gift, we've been given a purpose. And in purpose, we find such joy. In fact, one more quote, and then I'm done. I laid another server in our church. She said, serving the Lord and others means I found the purpose of living. To live is to serve. To serve Him means to serve others. When I look at what the Lord has done in my life, to serve Him and others is not an obligation, but an opportunity. And that's the way we view it. That's the way we see it, that God has done so great things in our lives. He's made us people of the Spirit. He's made us temples. He's given us His presence, presence rivers of living water. And now we, it's our joy and our privilege to give it to others. We do that individually, of course, but we must never forget. And I think this is our opportunity time to take deeper roots, to refocus on this reality that we assemble. When we assemble together, there is a spiritual purpose. There's a spiritual dynamic, a spiritual reality at play that's taking place, and it's giving those rivers to others. We've heard examples of those today from individuals last Sunday, the Sunday before, but I could keep going on and on and on how, they, how people are blessed and strengthened and encouraged. And I do say this genuinely. I see that this last year and a half, while it was a, in some ways a crisis time, we've discovered we're stronger than we thought. We've done, it's been an amazing time in many ways of outreach. And so, and so now as, we're, as society is reopening and we gather back together, we see afresh our purpose. It's a spiritual purpose. And we see that every single one of us has a gift. You are gifted. It is your reality. We, we grow in the gift. We discover more of the gift. But we, each of us have a gift. I'm asking you today, would you consider using your gift? If you're here in the Toronto area, I mean, if you're around the world, there's ways in what, part of our global community, there's maybe ways that you can get involved as well. But here in our Toronto area, can I ask you, would you use your gift? 
in this church family. I tell you, it would be such an honor to, to have you use your gift in this. You say, well, how do I do that, Nathan? Well, in many ways, I'll give you a couple examples in just a moment. But in many ways, find the greatest need and help it. You look at the local church, maybe when, you, when you're here and you see a need, figure a way to help it. You see, that's it. God shows you that problem or that area of need so that you can help it. You say, well, I don't know how to help it. Then maybe you can study how, find an answer for it. You might. God will give you, God, you have the mind of Christ. He'll give you wisdom how you can tackle that. But I do have some practical ways. And, I, and I, before you put them up there, let me just say this as well. You know, with, with, with the last year and a half of barely being able to meet, you know, over a year and a half, people move, people get married, people pass away, people get new jobs, people have kids, people, kids move out of home. So things are always changing. That's a living, breathing organism. And so a year and a half, it's almost like a year and a half since regular church life. Now we're reopening, regular church life resumes. And so in the area of serving, in the different areas of the church, of course, there's been a lot of shuffle, a lot of movement. I think every church is experiencing that. And so I think we look afresh at every area and say, you know what, there's areas where in every single ministry area where people are needed, where, where your gift is needed. And so go ahead and put it up on the screen, some different serving opportunities. Uh, I'm not going to leave it up there too long. It's actually, they're on our website. You can see some of those right now. Put up our website, if you will. Actually, that's because I need to wrap this up here. Put up the website where you can go, ticc.ca slash volunteer. If you can go to that website, and it's my challenge to this. It's been a different type of message, but this is a different type of time. It's a different type of time. And this is an opportunity for every one of us to use our gift. It's an opportunity for our church to take where we are and to go even further. It will involve every person using their gift, their talent, using their, it takes time and energy, but there's a refreshing. And I believe that our greatest days, your greatest days, our greatest days, still out in front of us, as people of the Spirit, is begin to use our gifts. You know, there was a time I didn't think I could preach. I didn't think I, but I discovered that gift. I've grown in it. I'm growing in it. You see, that's what it is. We don't have to have everything lined up. It doesn't have to be perfect, but we just get moving. You can steer a ship when it's moving. So I have my encouragement to you today is let's get moving. Let's start moving forward. Let's take our assignment. Let's take our purpose. Let's focus on that which God has called us to do. Amen. In a moment, Pastor Peter's going to have something powerful to share with us. Let me just say this. If you... See, I have never believed on Jesus, but I want to know him today. The scriptures say that when we, when we confess him as Lord of our lives and believe that Jesus, that Jesus is who he says he is, took our sins, rose again, that he gives us new spiritual life. We've been talking about people of the Spirit today. It would be my honor to pray with you today. Would you pray with me if that's you? Say, Dear Lord Jesus, thank you for loving me. Thank you for taking my sin. Thank you for rising from the dead. Right now, I believe that you are my Lord and you are my Savior. I receive your forgiveness and your grace in Jesus' name. And everyone said, Amen. It's been my privilege to pray with you. I invite you to this information on the screen, how you can get receive some free material. I also invite you, to, if you're here in the Toronto area, to come on out and visit us next Sunday here at 190 Railside Road. Well, right now, let's go to Pastor Peter. Uh, over to you, sir with the Lord's table. I'm going to be leading you in that in a moment to get the emblems ready at home. You know, something always sparks in my spirit, and I'm going to spend about two minutes, that's all, to talk about our financial stewardship. I thought of the word first. What does it mean, seek first God's kingdom? Is that some metaphorical, symbolic mind game that, you know, I'm kind of in my mind, I think God is number one? And, and I was drawn to read to you the context. Now, I'm going to read a verse here that's well known, but, but let's get it in context. It'll just take me about 30 seconds to read it. Uh, here we go. Matthew 6, 31. Do not worry then saying, what will we eat, what we will drink, or what will we wear for clothing? For the Gentiles eagerly seek these things, for your heavenly Father knows you need all these things. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be added unto you. So what shall we eat? What shall we drink? What are we going to dress in? Where are going to live? Maybe you've got a bigger family, so I need a bigger house. Or maybe your car is falling apart. These are things that everybody looks for. But God's economy is different. Make no mistake about it. We live in the same world, but some folks have not discovered God's economy. They, they're just saying, I need these things. We all need these things. Nothing wrong needing these things. Even your Heavenly Father knows you need these things. But God's economy is when we 
seek him first, not just as a symbolic gesture or as a thought in our mind. You know, I, I just believe God is number one. And you know, no, 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 we seek him first. And I think when it comes to our offering and our stewardship and all the great things our church is doing, I mean, we have stepped it up. You know, it's so sad. So often when churches kind of have to pull back because of pandemics and the likes, the first thing to go is evangelism and missions and outreach. That's like, oh, th th let's cut that part. But, but we're not like that. And we think, I, I want to say to you, God knows what you need, but on God's economy, we seek first His kingdom. His kingdom and His righteousness. And then our guarantee is that our Heavenly Father will see to it that these things that everybody needs, bona fide things, will be added to you. So today as we give, would you think about that? Would you take a step into God's economy, or maybe you've already been operating that way, go even deeper into it. Father, I thank you right now for the privilege of operating on God's economy. And I thank you for everyone within the sound of my voice who is stepping into God's economic system. Of all these things that we need, genuinely, genuine needs being added to us. I thank you, Father, in Jesus' name. Now, with, with that faith in your heart of God's guarantee of what your Heavenly Father has committed to do for you, would you sow into God's kingdom through this church right now? And you can see on the screen, I'm going to ask that the control room puts it up, you know, so you see all the different ways we can give. It's the e-transfer. Many, many are doing that. You can text the word give and then the appropriate phone number. You can mail your check. You can phone it in. And then online giving. Many, many are doing that as well. So that is for all the people in the greater Toronto area. If people are watching outside of the area, and we know that you are, we need your help as well. So for a second, just go to that international outside of, outside of Canada screen as well. I can see it up there how you can give on U.S. dollars, euros. Very few are doing this yet, but we really want to encourage you to do that. Let's go back to the Toronto screen because that is really the, 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 you know, that's the front and center. Without that, friends, dear friends in Toronto, if it wasn't for you, we would have to stagnate and fall back. But because of your love and commitment, we have not stagnated. We have stepped it up instead. And so we, we're putting this into practice, seeking first God's kingdom, not pulling back. And it looks like that would be the reasonable thing to do. So thank you right now. This is Mother's Day. Let's do something big for the gospel. Let's do something big. I, I want to kind of jolt you a little bit because I realize that there's lockdown. People think, oh, I'll catch up later. I'll do it later. And, and we keep saying that. And a week become two weeks and three weeks. Really, we need a, a breakthrough. And I think you need a breakthrough. So let's, let's seek God's kingdom with our giving. So let's do that. Put up the screen one more time in case for the, for the Toronto givers, the e-transfers and all that. Put it up right there. There you see. Leave it there for just about another 10 seconds. Take a picture of it if you have to so that you have it handy. Now, lots going to happen. Lots going to happen. And I know that Megan, I can see her just out of the corner of my eye. She's waiting to talk to you. So over to you, Megan, right now. Thank you, Pastor Peter. According to the Global Child Forum, one of the most damaging legacies from the lockdowns due to the COVID-19 pandemic is said to be the impact on young people. Some epidemiologists have called it the shadow pandemic, which highlights the unintended consequences of the lockdowns on society. Domestic abuse, social isolation, loneliness and lack of access to education are some of the reasons why stats canada lists young people aged 15 to 24 at greatest risk of experiencing traumatic mental effects during the lockdowns 36 percent of young people said they're extremely concerned about family stress and maintaining social ties with loved ones over a year ago when the pandemic started our Celebration Church youth team expanded their ministry outreach beyond the regular Friday gatherings to include small groups on Zoom. Here are some of our youth leaders describing their experience over the last year. 
Hi Celebration Church and Hi Rain Toronto. My name is Carrie, and I just want to share really, really briefly about our Rain um, Thursday night, 9 p.m. discipleship group on Zoom. When we gather, each of us comes with, we just share, you know, how um, how the video, how the preach has impacted us and what we've learned from it. And it's amazing to hear that. And then, and then on top of that, after we share that, then we each submit like something that we want prayer for, and then we pray for each other. And then after that, we all just share how God has been blessing us in the week. So we all give a praise report. It's pretty cool. You know what, what's so amazing about this, guys? It's amazing to see how youth have put aside time to come to talk about and discuss Jesus and just to see how the Holy Spirit is working in their lives. And you know what's amazing about this? You know what's really amazing? This is not just um, a social group. It's not just a social group, not at all. It's a place where the Holy Spirit is manifested and he's there. And I don't know, maybe it's because we've persisted for over a year, but now when we arrive, when like when we gather, he's there. Like you can feel his presence and it's so tangible. And how do we know the Holy Spirit is there? Because lives are being um, visibly changed, visibly um, and uh, just visibly changed. And it's amazing to see. Take care. So one benefit that I can think of when I think of the Zoom rooms is that it's such a safe space where I know for myself personally, and I think others would agree is that Whatever it is that we're meditating on that week, or just in general, we're able to bring it to um, the group. And if it's something that we're believing for, we can share it with others and they can hold us accountable and remain in faith for it. And that's just what I love about it. It's a space where there's constant laughs and maybe even a few tears. But that's what's great about it. We're just able to share um, whatever is on our hearts and grow in the Holy Spirit. And that's what I love about it. Hi, my name is Jazz and I'll be talking about Thursday night Zoom calls at Rain. Now, Thursday night Zoom calls are a lot of fun because before that, you get to watch um, a sermon that has to do with Christianity, faith, things to learn, all of that stuff. And afterwards, you get to join into the Zoom call and talk about it amongst each other, like what you learned from it and what you can do and what you can apply into your life um, through it. And after that, you get to pray with each other. And I really think that prayer at Rain Youth is like, it's really special um, because it's just, you get to gather with each other and just be, just like be there in the presence of God. And it's, it's really amazing. So yeah, I hope that you join in and yeah, bye. Hey, it's Matt here. Um, just here to encourage some of our youth and young adults. If you're not meeting up with us in person, as we are back, I encourage you to join us on Zoom. There are tons of benefits, but one of the, the two main ones is that you're able to be able to connect with us still, right? In a time where there's a lot of changes happening, it's important to be able to connect and you're and you will for sure be challenged on a day-to-day -day basis from our, our once a week Zoom calls to to live out in God's goodness. Thank you, Celebration Church family, for making this possible. Without your support, your prayers, your love, this would not be possible. You are bringing both spiritual and mental health for some of our most vulnerable in our society. You helped our youth expand during a lockdown when they would have every reason to hold back. Thank you, church, for your love, your prayers, and your support. Hello, Celebration Church. Here are three things you need to know this Sunday. Thank you to everyone who made last Sunday, June 13th, a great success as we reopened indoor worship here at 190 Railside Road. It was great to be together again, and you can see some pictures scrolling across the screen as I speak of preaching and worship and enjoying the presence of God and each other. Indoor worship, along with Kids World Classes, continues now every Sunday at 10.30 a.m. and 1 p.m., and we invite you to be a part next Sunday. Have you been water baptized? You are invited to be water baptized Sunday, July 11th at the 10.30 a.m. service. Jesus instructed that after we believe in him, we are to make a public demonstration of our faith through water baptism. Standing in the water is a very real picture of Jesus dying on the cross. Immersing in the water symbolizes Jesus being buried in the tomb 
and being raised from the water symbolizes Jesus rising from the dead. We bury the old life and we rise to walk in a new life. To be water baptized, go to www.ticc.ca slash water baptism and register today. You are welcome. With the reopening here in Ontario, Indoors Youth and Young Adults Worship Services resume every Friday at 7.30 p.m. here at 190 Roseside Road. All youth and young adults are invited to this awesome experience every Friday. Finally, it is Father's Day today, so please watch this short thank you video to all the dads. Sometimes I wonder where I'd be without you. Would I understand life? Would I make right choices? Would I live out my faith? Thank you for showing me what it means to love God and for giving me your all, even when it was difficult. Thank you for the discipline I deserved and the grace I didn't, and for being present, even though you had so much on your plate. Thank you for picking me up and encouraging me to try again, and for the little life lessons I still lean on today. The truth is, I wouldn't be who I am if it wasn't for you. As I look back on my life, I see moment after moment where your influence, your wisdom, and your strength made all the difference. Thank you for loving me. Today, I give thanks. Today, I am grateful. Today, I celebrate you. I love you, Dad. I'm going to ask you at home, if you're watching, just to get a, a, the, the emblems ready, get bread and get drink at home, and we're going to participate together. I get you, give you a moment's opportunity to just get your emblems ready. I want to speak a, a word to you today. You know, uh, the word Jehovah in the Old Testament is representing the redemptive names of God. And when we are celebrating the Lord's table, we are celebrating the redemption that God provided for every one of us through Jesus Christ. And here's the word that came. When Abraham was looking for how he was going to give an offering on Mount Moriah, the Lord said, Jehovah Jireh, the Lord will provide. And I want to speak that over your life today as we celebrate the redemption of Jesus Christ. Jehovah Jireh, the Lord will provide for you. That includes in every area of your life. If you're lacking, maybe you feel uh, you're lacking joy. You feel like you're beaten down by all the circumstances around you. Jehovah Jireh. Maybe you feel that you're lacking, uh, you know, in your spiritual strength. Jehovah Jireh. Maybe you feel like you're lacking health in your body. We just prayed for some of the prayer requests. Jehovah Jireh, the Lord will provide. Maybe you're lacking wisdom or maybe you're lacking, uh, you know, you don't know what to do in a financial area. Jehovah Jireh, the Lord will provide. And I want you to take the Lord's table with us at home today and whatever you need. I, I listed just a few needs. It could be many, many others. The list could be long and it's individual. Maybe there's something very personal. But we take the Lord's table today, remembering the Lord provides, Jehovah Jireh. So Jesus took bread and he broke it and he said, this is my body broken for you. Let's partake of the bread. Thank you. Then he took the cup, saying this cup is the new covenant in my blood. As often as you drink it, do it in remembrance of me. Let's partake of the cup. Take a moment and lift up your hands with me. Thank you, Holy Spirit, that you make this very real to the people watching at home, the ones who maybe haven't left their house for a long time. I thank you, Lord, that you provide for them. Just lift up your hands at home as people are doing here in the room and just say, thank you, Lord, 
that you are my Jehovah Jireh. You are the Lord, my provider. Have a little shouting time right at home in front of your computer, in front of your telephone. Have a little, you know, uh, hallelujah time. If you wish, just say, thank you, Jesus, uh, that you have become my redeemer. Let's do it right here in the room. Let's thank God for Jehovah Jireh. The Lord is our provider. Give the Lord a big praise. Well, that's beautiful, and I know you're praising the Lord, and let us know. Reach out to us uh, by email or in the chat room where you're watching there online as well. And as I mentioned last week, we have discontinued our encounter rooms after the online service simply because we started those when we weren't able to meet in person, and we are meeting now in person on Sundays uh, here at 190 Railside Road at 1030 and at 1 o'clock, and so uh, we're not continuing the encounter rooms at this time. We're continuing our online. I think that's something that will stay, and so uh, we, it's been our honor to be with you today, but we do love to hear from you, so email us. If you have a prayer request, it would be our honor to pray with you. We have Miracle Monday, a prayer night every Monday night, and so we've seen God doing amazing answers to prayer. Let's just close this time in a word of prayer. Father, I thank you for every person gathered uh, online, Father, and I thank you for uh, your love for them. I thank you, as we, Pastor Peter just prayed, you are our provider, you are our healer, and so, Father, I thank you that you are with every person now, Father, in the name of Jesus, meeting every need. Father, I thank you that you meet every need according to your riches and according to your great supply father we thank you for it in jesus name everyone said amen well we love you we're praying for you and we look forward to see you next sunday god bless